and welcome to the concluding event of the Aspen Action Forum. I must say that it has been approximately 10 times better than I thought it would be. Uh, people from around the world, all of our Young Leaders programs have come in, and what we have done is set up a process at the Institute, which has always been in favor of thought leading to action, where we actually take an ideas festival and start our summer with it, but then have this as a high point where the ideas lead to action. Over the past two and a half days, I've really gotten a tear in my eye two or three times. I think Jillian said that too, wasn't it? Somebody said, you have to get a tear in your eye when somebody says, this is a great idea, here's how we're gonna turn it into action. It's also been very impressive just to see the number of people from our, Peter, how many leadership initiatives around the world? 15, 15 leadership initiatives. Every one of them represented. Uh, I can think of nobody better than to, uh, to uh, be the uh, capstone speaker of this event than Tom Friedman. Tom has not only been a person who understands thought leading to action, but in my old uh, trade of journalism, there were really two groups of people, people who did a lot of reporting and people who did thinking. There was very little overlap, but there was one overlap in that Venn diagram, and right in the center of it is Tom Friedman, a person of ideas, but also a person who goes on the ground, talks to people in the Middle East, not just about Middle East peace, but about Middle East environment issues and how they're gonna affect uh, the future of the Middle East. What he does every week, at least, two or three times a week, is give us a new idea. Uh, there's nothing uh, sort of stale or knee-jerk about any of Tom's opinions. They're not only based on reporting, they're based on having an open mind, and they're based on a belief that ideas have consequences and ideas lead to actions. So to, kick, to uh, culminate this action forum, Tom Friedman, our friend. Thanks, Walter. Thanks, Walter. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Walter. It's a, it's a treat to be here. Um, I was on this uh, stage uh, about uh, five weeks ago to talk about a documentary I was doing on uh, climate change and the Arab awakening. And um, I know there's so many interesting people here that um, I, I really want to hear from you um, much more than you probably want to hear from me. So I, the reporter in me um, decided that we're going to split up this hour where I'm going to uh, take the next 20 minutes or so and just tell you what is my latest thinking, what am I thinking about uh, right now. And then I really want to open it up for a discussion and, and hear from uh, all of you and try to answer as many questions as I can not just about what I'm working on, about what's going on in the world today. So uh, I'm just gonna move this up a little bit so it's a little louder, is that better? Okay. Um, so what, uh, what am I thinking about? Um, what I'm thinking about is that when historians look back at the first part of the 21st century, what will they say was the most important thing that happened. Was it 9-11? Was it the subprime crisis? Was it the marriage of William and Kate? <laughs> or the breakup of Brad and Jen? <laughs> what will they say was the most important thing? Well, what I've been really thinking about is that I think when we look back at this period, what historians will say is the most important thing to happen was the merger of globalization and the IT revolution that created a world that wasn't just connected anymore, but a world that was hyper-connected, a world of ubiquitous and continuous connectivity. And I want to talk for a few minutes about what I mean by that, because I am a plumber uh, at heart, that is, None of the columns that I'm writing um, are, I'm not just throwing darts. Underneath them is a, is, a, is a sense of what is the plumbing, the wiring of the world right now, and how it can explain you know, not just one event, 
but more events in more places, in more ways, on more days. And that to me is this merger of globalization and the IT revolution, which in my own shorthand I call the great inflection. And I think in time, we will understand that this inflection is as important as Gutenberg's invention of the printing press was. That its impact on civilization will be as important as movable type. I always think, you know, there were hundreds of millions of people who were around when Gutenberg invented the printing press. There were people who were there, and somebody probably said to somebody else when that happened, you know what? This is pretty cool. We're going to be able to get rid of all those scribes and print books for everybody in the world. How cool is that? That's probably going to have a pretty big impact. And it did, but it played out over several hundred years. Well, my argument is that you and I, we just happen to be alive when another huge inflection happened. Something that's changing every institution, every cost structure, every product, almost every way we make and learn and interact. But it was disguised, in my view, by the subprime crisis in post 9-11. So even though we're all living it, we're all experiencing it, nobody has actually been explaining it to people. And I want to just take a few minutes here to give you my, my first crack on this. Now, I started thinking about this in the year 2000, in the early 2000s, because I wrote a book back then called The World is Flat. And the argument was that the world was getting connected. That book was actually not about connectivity. The real core argument of that book was really about what was happening to individuals. The simple argument of the world is flat was that we had gone through three great era of globalization. We've gone through many, but I would define three great era. And the first era, from 1492 till the early 1800s, in order to act globally as an individual, you needed a country. To act globally, you needed a country. Columbus needed Spain to fund his discovery of the Americas. Then beginning in the 1800s and 1900s with the Dutch East India Company, you could act globally if you had a company. You needed a company. But if you had a company searching for markets or labor, you could act globally as an individual. The simple argument of the world is flat, was that what was really new what actually happened right around the turn of the millennium was that for the first time in the history of the world, individuals, individuals could act globally as individuals. And what that book was really about was the platform that made that possible, a platform that I described as flat. Now, what did that platform consist of? What made that individual empowerment possible? Four things, I argued. The first was the PC. What the personal computer allowed was for individuals, individuals for the first time in the history of the world, to author their own content in digital form, in the form of bits and bytes. Now, individuals, men and women, have been authoring their own content ever since cave women and cave men etched on cave walls. But with the PC, individuals were able to author their own content in digital form. And once it was in digital form, words, data, photos, spreadsheets, music, video, it could be manipulated and sent so many more different ways. Now, that just happened to coincide. It didn't have to. But that just happened to coincide in the early 90s with something called the internet. So suddenly I could author my own content in digital form. And then along came this thing called the internet where I could suddenly send my digital content anywhere in the world virtually for free. And that coincided 
with a third breakthrough. Again, it didn't have to happen, but it did, which I call workflow software. That's the alphabet soup of protocols, HTML, HTTP, XML, AJAX, SOAP, all of those things, what they added up to was a body of, of software, workflow software that allowed work to flow, that allowed me to author my own content, send it anywhere in the world for free, and collaborate with people anywhere else in the world. And last came along Google and search, so I could suddenly search my content in yours in ways that were fundamentally, fundamentally new. The convergence of those four things, which happened right around the year 2000, created a platform where we woke up one day and found that more people, more individuals in more places could collaborate with more other individuals in more other places for less money than ever before. And that was what I meant when I said, the world is flat. That we'd created that platform. Now had I been scrupulously accurate, I would have called the book, The World is Flattening. <laughs> it would have sold 100 copies. <laughs> and not gotten people's attention. Because that platform, I always understood, only really applied to a billion people. What happened? in just the last 10 years was the radical expansion of this platform. I was wrong. The world is so much flatter than I thought. And I really got onto this because I started The World is Flat in 2004. I started a new book in 2011 with my friend Michael Mandelbaum about America called That Used to Be Us. And the first thing I did when I started the new book was go back to the first edition of The World is Flat, just to remind myself what I had said. Some of you may have heard me say this in conversation with Walter when the book came out. I pulled that first edition off the bookshelf, I cracked it open to the index, looked under A, B, C, D, E, F, F, A, A. Facebook wasn't in it. When I was running around the world saying, the world is flat, we're all connected. Facebook didn't exist. Twitter was still a sound. The cloud was still in the sky. 4G was a parking place. LinkedIn was a prison. Applications what you sent to college. Big data was a rap star and Skype was a typo. Okay. All, all of that. I love doing, can I do that again, Walter? <laughs> All of that happened after I wrote The World is Flat. So what that told me is something really big had happened. That we had gone from a world where this platform could be accessed by a billion people to a world where this platform is now being accessed by three billion people and growing every day. How did it happen? Well, let's go back to the fourth forces that flatten the world. First, the ability to author your own content. Think about what happened in the last seven years. That went from the PC to this. And it went from this to the tablet, and not this to the tablet, this to the tablet connected with much faster computing power thanks to Moore's Law and the cloud. Suddenly with this, I am connected to a global toolbox where I can pull down the most powerful tools to create content for pennies, nickels, and dimes. The ability of people to author their own content has exploded. Second, my ability to send that content anywhere. Thanks to wireless and mobility, I can now send my content to more places, from more places, with mobile and high-speed bandwidth. Third, my ability to collaborate, wow, with Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Indiegogo, Kickstarter, Airbnb. Do you realize how people's ability to collaborate has exploded to crowdsource and crowdfund in just 10 years? And lastly, my ability to search 
has gone to big data. I can now search, draw out patterns through algorithms, and immediately apply the learning of those patterns to my creative endeavors. So if you put all four together, and then you add the fact that we are also not just connecting everyone, but everything, we are heading toward the universal internet of everything. So folks, something big has really happened in the last 10 years. We're all living it, we're all feeling it, we're all enjoying it, and we're all totally stressed out by it. <laughs> and nobody at the political level is talking to you about it. One party is telling you, we just need to cut your taxes and it'll all be fine. Somebody tells you we just need a little more stimulus demand and it'll all be fine. It will not all be fine. Something really big has happened. And my argument, the reason I wanted to start here, is that this change in the plumbing it can't explain everything in the world, but it explains a lot of things. So let me just go through a few. I drew up a few examples this morning as I was getting ready to talk. Just some things that were, were on my mind. I'm a regular reader of Haaretz online. I follow the Middle East. Haaretz online has been in business about five years. Great way to follow the Israeli media, Middle East. I started noticing something in Haaretz online about six weeks ago. I'd call up my favorite columnist, Ari Shavit, and next to Ari's column was an advertisement for how to hit my golf ball 20 yards farther with accuracy. <laughs> and my first reaction was, I didn't know how Arts had golf ads. <laughs> and then I thought, that's really cool. Arts has golf ads. But how did they know I'm a golfer? <laughs> Paging Edward Snowden. <laughs> That's the first. First sign of the hyperconnected world. Second sign. I was in San Francisco speaking at the New School Summit in May, a great event. And I had rented a car from Hertz. And I had to change the reservation. I, 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 in the middle of my trip, I had to change everything. Where I got the car, where I dropped it off, where I, you know, the whole thing. So I went to my Hertz thing, I called the 1-800 Hertz, and I got an uh, automated artificial intelligent voice on the line, <laughs> and it said, give me your reservation number. I dutifully did that, waited for the voice to say, now wait on the line, a Hertz service representative will be with you shortly. Your call may be recorded for quality purposes. <laughs> I never got the Hertz represent representative. I did the entire and I tell you, it was complex interaction with artificial intelligence. Check. Tell your girls not to try to be a Hertz service rep when they grow up. <laughs> that job is gone. Three weeks later, I was in Yemen doing the documentary that I talked about here. Went to London. I was at Heathrow Airport. I was standing in the Passport line, guy in front of me turns around, recognized me, said, hi, I interview people wherever I go, as some of you know. And uh, I said, where are you from? What do you do? We had a lot of time in line. He said, I'm in the software business. He said, oh, so that's great. I'm interested in technology. What, what's your software? Uh, he said, my goal is to make every lawyer obsolete. <laughs> Honest to God. Um, uh, his name was John Lord, um, and he said, uh, he said his, com his company's goal is to make every lawyer obsolete by creating software applications that enable individuals to do more in complex legal work without the aid of an attorney. His company's called Neoto Logic, 
And it says on its website that its goal is to massively improve access to advice and justice to the 40% of Americans who can't afford an attorney when they need one. Neotologic is part of a new strain of software called Expert Systems. They aim to identify a large chunk of business that clients need and that lawyers charge for, but can be done by software, like TurboTax. On their website, somebody wrote in to complain that, yeah, you got your, your uh, TurboTax lawyer thing, but it can't read between the lines, and it can't hold hands and wipe away tears to which Neotologic posted on its website, you will surely see a press release when we can. <laughs> okay, that got my attention. Uh, call the girls. Girls, law school's out, okay? <laughs> well, maybe they should go back to school, I thought. Well, we got a connection with the school because my mother-in-law is from Iowa. And as some of you know, my mother-in-law, Kay Boxholm, was chairman of the board of Grinnell College, God bless her, where she went to school, wonderful, liberal arts college in central Iowa. Great, great, great school, Grinnell. In 2011, 9% of applica all applications to Grinnell College came from China. Of those, 43% had perfect 800s on their math SATs. <laughs> That's also the hyper-connected world. Girls, try somewhere other than Grinnell. <laughs> okay. So, um, so then I thought, well, maybe they could work part-time. And um, uh, yeah, for the summer, you know, get a, get a summer job at Jamba Juice. Jamba Juice, yeah, a lot of, lot of part-time employment on Jamba Juice. But then I read this piece in the New York Times. It said that at the Jamba Juice shop at 53rd and Lexington in Manhattan, along with juice oranges and wearing blenders, is another tool vital to their business, the Weather Channel. The shop's managers frequently look at the channel's website and plug the temperature and rain forecast into their software that they use to schedule employees. If the mercury is going to hit 95 the next day, the software will suggest scheduling more employees based on the historic increase in store traffic in hot weather. At the 53rd Street store, the manager, Mr. Rosser, uh, Ms. Rosser, said they, that can mean seven employees additional on the busy 11 to 2 shift rather than the typical 4 or 5. Such powerful scheduling software has been widely adopted by retail and restaurant chains. The program that Jamba bought in 2009 breaks down schedules into 15-minute increments. So if the lunchtime rush at a particular shop slows down at 1.45, the software suggests cutting 15 minutes from the shift of an employee normally scheduled from 9 to 2. Karen Louie, Jamba's chief financial officer, said scheduling software has helped the company reduce labor costs by 4 to 5%, saving millions of dollars a year. Uh, Girls better not work at Jamba Juice. <laughs> no, but, but my, they're, 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 really, they're really smart girls. They both went to Ivy League College. So I thought, maybe, maybe Google. But then I, I picked up this piece on June 13th in the time. Um, it was an interview with Laszlo Bach, senior VP for people operations at Google. He said, if you're looking for a job at Google, don't rest on your Ivy League laurels. The company is taking a more data-centric approach to understanding what makes for successful hires, in lieu of focusing on degrees or transcripts. Bach said, quote, GPAs are worthless as a criteria for hiring, and test scores are worthless. No correlation at all except for brand new college grads where there's a slight correlation. This discovery has led Google to hire more people with no college degree at all. Up to 14% of some teams are now made of people who never attended college Bach offered some suggestions about what's wrong with higher ed. I think academic environments are artificial environments. People who succeed there are sort of finely trained. Their are conditioned to succeed in that environment. One of my own frustrations when I was in college and grad school is that you knew the professor was looking for a specific answer, so that's what you gave him. That's not what we do around here. Well, Google's out. <laughs> so maybe they should travel with me. Maybe they should travel with me. I was. I was in Cairo, and then I was, um, I was in Taksim Square when the uh, uprising happened in Turkey. Even got a little tear gassed. And um, really interesting event watching Taksim Square when you see it from my perspective of the hyper-connected world. Because Erdogan, the Turkish prime minister, is clueless about this world. What he doesn't understand is that in a hyper-connected world, every leader, Every boss, every journalist today is in a two-way conversation. There are no more one-way conversations. So Taksim Turkish students take over Taksim Square to preserve it as a green space from a huge mega project that Erdogan wants to build up, honoring the Ottoman Empire. 
Erdogan goes nuts on June 7. He rails against the United States. He gives a speech and he says, what did they do about Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street? They used tear gas on their people. They caused the death of 17 people on Wall Street. What was the reaction? That's what Erdogan said. We killed 17 people in Occupy Wall Street. I didn't know that. Neither did the US Embassy in Istanbul, because within an hour, the American Embassy in Turkey issued a statement in English and Turkish on Twitter rebutting Erdogan. No US deaths resulted from police actions in Occupy Wall Street. No wonder Erdogan denounced Twitter as society's worst menace. <laughs> he doesn't like two-way conversations, no, but it got better, because three Turkish Americans decided that they wanted to rally other Turkish Americans in support of their uprising. So they went to Indiegogo, a crowdfunding site, and said, we need $53,600 to buy a full page ad in the New York Times. And in 24 hours on Indiegogo, they raised 80,000 and bought a full page ad denouncing Erdogan completely crowdfunded on Indiegogo. Then they took a poll of how did people want them to spend the change between 53,000 and 80,000. We're all in two-way conversations today. So what is this telling us, and I will stop here. It's telling us a bunch of things, it seems to me. First thing it's telling us is that um, this is gonna be a great time, excuse me, this is gonna be a great time to be a consumer. While in the hyper-connected world, I mean, you have the world's, every, every book, every bit of knowledge in the world available to you through Google entirely for free. Twitter gives everybody a free megaphone and publishing platform for free. Amazon.com, you can now actually not only get anything from a buzzsaw to, um, to a book at the best price in the world, but if you want to become an author now, you don't have to go through my publisher, Farrar Strauss, and send them 100 different letters to beg them to look at your manuscript. You can go now through Kindle publishing and publishing your own, publish your own book for free. What a great time to be a consumer. It's going to be a great time to be an individual entrepreneur. Fantastic time. If you just have the spark of an idea, now if I just have a spark of an idea, I can go to Delta in Taiwan and they'll design that for me. Skip over to Hangzhou, my friend Jack Ma at Alibaba will line up 30 Chinese manufacturers to make this for me. Jump back over to Seattle and my pal Jeff Bezos will do my fulfillment and delivery and gift wrap it for Walter for Christmas. <laughs> Craigslist will get me an accountant and on freelancer.com I can get someone to do my logo for $19.95 unless somebody else bids $18.95. It's going to be a great time to be an entrepreneur if you've got this. My view is there's no more developed and developing countries. That's so round world. The world is gonna be divided between HIEs and LIEs. High imagination enabling countries and low imagination enabling countries. Countries that enable this are gonna thrive. And countries that don't are gonna fall farther and faster behind. Gonna be a great time to be number one in your field. If you are J.K. Rowling or Michael Jordan, wow in a world where you can now access every individual market, the returns, the winner-take-all returns, are gonna be fantastic. Not gonna be a good time to be number two in your field. And it's certainly not gonna be a good time, and this is one of my central points, to be average. Because in the hyper-connected world, average is officially over. Your boss today, he or she has cheaper, cheaper, easier, faster access to more above average automation, above average software, above average robotics, above average cheap labor, and above average cheap genius. Average is officially over. That old saying in Texas, if all you ever do is all you've ever done, all you ever get is all you ever got, that is N-A, no longer applicable. If all you ever do is all you've ever done, all you'll ever get is not all you ever got you will get below average and much faster. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking very easy for you to say 
Mr. Smarty Pants, New York Times columnist. <laughs> now let me tell you about my job. I inherited James Reston's office in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times in 1995 when I took over my column. What a thrill to have the office of this incredible columnist and author and reporter and editor for the New York Times. And I suspect back in the 60s and 70s, when Mr. Reston was really at his height, he would come to that office every morning and say to himself, I wonder what my seven competitors are going to write today. And he personally knew all seven. I can name them. Walter Lippmann, Mary McGroy, Stuart Elsop, Joseph Kraft, Tony Lewis, I, 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 Mary McGroy, I know them. I do the same thing. I come to that same office every morning and I say to myself, I wonder what my 70 million competitors are going to write to. <laughs> I have 70 million competitors. And if you think I am not aware of that, not am I aware of it, I thrive with it because I've got so many other voices to draw on from around the world. Oh, but it gets better. You see, last year, New York Times started NewYorkTimes.com.cn, New York Times in Chinese. We translate a lot of NewYorkTimes.com into Chinese and, and, uh, and some of the columnists, uh, and including mine. Now, it happens to be shut down because we did report that Wen Jiaobao's mother-in-law and entire family were worth $2.7 billion. And um, it's, it's, for the moment, shut down, but it'll come back. <laughs> now, I've been going to China for 20-some years. And when I used to go to China 20 years ago, I had one goal in mind to tell my mother-in-law in Chicago something she didn't know about China. That was my goal. And it happens that for most of that time, my mother-in-law in Chicago had never been to China. So frankly, I hope I never did, but I could write a pretty average column. Chopsticks, panda bears, whatever, you know. Um, <laughs> I never did, but, but I could. You know what my goal now when I go to China is? When I know my columns in Chinese, my column is to tell people in Chengdu something they don't know about China. Oh, that ain't average. The amount of work, preparation, thinking, and reporting I have to do to tell someone in China something they don't know about China or maybe haven't thought of, that ain't average. So average is over for me like everybody else. I live in Bethesda, Maryland, down the road from Baltimore. Biggest employer in Baltimore 50 years ago was a company called Bethlehem Steel. You could join Bethlehem, you could drop out of high school, join the steel union, get an average job at Bethlehem Steel with an average salary, work an average number of 30 years, buy an average mortgage, you get an average house with an average yard, have 2.0 average kids, go to an average number of Baltimore Orioles games, an average number of visits to Disney World, have a perfectly average retirement and a wonderfully average funeral. All as a high school dropout. What's the biggest employer in Baltimore today? Bethlehem Steel is long gone. Johns Hopkins University Medical Center. They don't let you mow the lawn there without a BA, okay? <laughs> I speak metaphorically, but you know what I mean. Because what's basically happening in the hyper-connected world is that every middle-class job is being pulled in three directions at once. It either requires more skill, it's going up. It has more machines or people around the world who can compete for it, it's going out or it's going down. It's being outsourced, made obsolete, outsourced to history faster than ever. It's my argument that the anxiety around this is something that is coursing through middle and lower middle class populations all over the world. And it's not the only explanation, but it can explain a lot of everything from Occupy Wall Street to the Tea Party to Tahrir Square, to Taksim Square. And what makes it worse is not only are leaders not acknowledging it, really touching it for people, they're actually making them stupid. They're peddling this notion that Bill Clinton peddled in 1990s at the Democratic Convention when it was true. But they're still peddling it today when it is no longer true that if you just work hard and play by the rules, you can be in the middle class. I wish. You want to be in the middle class today, you have to work harder, smarter, relearn quicker, and more often, and rewrite the rules, and then you can be in the middle class. Let me just conclude with one last point related to this. 
because it's the last, I think, epiphenomena related to this hyperconnectivity. My argument, basically, is we now live in a 401k world. That basically what the hyper-connecting of the world did was take a world where if, we, if the world had a dial on it, for the last 60 years of the Cold War in particular, the dial was set to the left of center. And the dial said, you live in a world of defined benefits. I worked at the New York Times. I've been there since 1981. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm heading for 33 years. For the first uh, 30 years, I had a defined benefit. I had a, I had a, I had a New York Times pension. I could do my job, average, better than average, whatever, but I lived in a world of defined benefits. I knew if I showed up every day, wrote a decent column, I would be guaranteed this pension. My argument is this hyper-connectivity of the last decade has shifted the dial. The meter's over here. It says you now live in a world of defined contributions. Your benefit today will be so much more directly related and correlated to your contribution than ever before. That is a huge shift. And as you all know, if you turn on late night TV, there are 30 people who will tell you how to invest your 401k. But there is nobody who will tell you how to invest in yourself. And to me, that is one of the biggest challenges we face as a country. How to enable, empower, nurture, encourage, help every American in a world that's shifting from defined benefits to defined contributions to invest in themselves. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we got about a half hour. The floor is open. We can talk about anything that or anything else that uh, people would like to talk about. The only condition is you got to tell me who you are and what you're doing. So start over there. I'll move around. Sorry, they got a microphone. In Alabama, I'm a visitor here. Um, what do you do, Ken? I'm retired. Okay. I was an engineer. Okay, great. Um, it seems to me with from what you're saying, that the logical extension is education. And the question is, where does the uh, compensation for that education come from? What do you mean by that? Elaborate on that. Just Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to pay for it? Yeah. Right. It's got to um, be built and it's got to be paid for. It. Yeah. Well, I, say, I think the logical extension is, is really, um, certainly education is the headline. But we have two educational challenges now as a society. We need both more education and better education. And so what do I mean by that? We have a whole cohort of, of people, young people today, come from disadvantaged backgrounds and neighborhoods, who, um, who are so far below average that they have no chance of finishing high school with uh, the ability to get any advanced education without massive remediation. So that, I call that the problem of the three R's. That's a problem of reading and writing and arithmetic. I mean, they need the basics, okay. Um, and we need more of that, and we all know the challenge of that. But I think the good news is a lot of people are working on that, you know, both within the public school system. Washington, D.C. just reported its um, uh, reading and math scores this year um, that were up, and uh, the charter school movement. Think, think they'll keep all kinds of people are working on that problem, thank God. We have another challenge though, and that's to bring our average to the global heights. And that's more about what my friend Tony Wagner calls the three C's, creativity, communication, and collaboration. All those kind of soft skills that really encourage you to do this. Because um, in this world, everyone is gonna have to be more entrepreneurial. No matter what, you know, McKinsey's done a wonderful new study um, uh, about the 12 disruptive, the great disruptive technologies out there. And, and one of the points they make is that you really have to, as you approach the world today, you have to think of less as, what is my job gonna be? 
but more of how am I going to earn income? Okay? And it's, a, it's a very subtle, but it's a very important shift. So I did a story a couple weeks ago about Airbnb. Amazing um, phenomena, Airbnb, for those of you who aren't aware of it. But in the process of researching Airbnb, I found, I, I came upon two uh, young women who both had rented their apartments for the last year in San Francisco on Airbnb and raised $20,000 from that, and that was the seed money for the company they started up. So everyone's, you know, is that a job? Is that, you know, I mean, everyone's kind of got to be relentlessly entrepreneurial. You know, when, whenever parents ask me, you know, like, okay, you've just described this world, what, what do you tell your own kids? Um, uh, what, what I say, and my own kids uh, are sick of hearing this, but um, uh, what, what I say is there's four things, I, 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 four pieces of advice I have. How to, how to approach this world, to, uh, or, or uh, uh, how to lean in, to use a, um, one of Cheryl's terms. First, think like an immigrant. How does a new immigrant think? Think like a new immigrant. New immigrant thinks, you know, I just showed up here in uh, Colorado, and there is no legacy spot waiting for me at the University of Denver. I better figure out what's going on here, where the best opportunities are, and pursue them with greater vigor than anybody else. I have an Armenian friend who likes to say, new immigrants are paranoid optimists. They are optimists because they picked up from somewhere worse and came somewhere they thought would be better, and they are paranoid. They think it can be taken from them any moment. Think like an immigrant, stay hungry. Second, think like an artisan. How does, I got this idea from Larry Katz at Harvard, great labor economist. How does the artisan, who is the artisan? Artisan was that person before mass manufacturing who made every item individually, every saddle, every piece of cutlery, every plate, every table, every piece of clothing, every shoe, the artisan made individually. And what did the best artisans do? They carved their initials into their work. That is, they brought so much individual extra to it, they took so much pride in it, they carved their initials into it. Do your job every day as if you wanted to carve your initials into it at the end of the day, because you brought so much value add to it, your boss would never think of letting you go. Third, I got this idea from Reed Hoffman at LinkedIn. Always think like a startup in Silicon Valley, even as an individual. Reed wrote a great book, The Startup of You, which is about this. Reed always likes to say in Silicon Valley there's only one four-letter word. It starts with F, actually, but it actually isn't four letters. And that word is finished. If you ever think you're finished, you really are finished. Always think of yourself as a work in progress. Always be learning, relearning, re-engineering, and reinventing, because the world doesn't care what you know. The Google machine knows everything. The world only cares what you can do with what you know. And lastly, think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House in Minneapolis, <laughs> my favorite restaurant. Okay? Uh, when I was working on the book, I, I went to have breakfast at Perkins on France Avenue and Highway 100 with my best friend, Ken Greer. And um, 7 in the morning, I ordered three buttermilk pancakes and scrambled egg. Ken ordered three buttermilk pancakes and fruit. And after 15 minutes, the waitress came, put our two plates down, and all she said to Ken was, I gave you extra fruit. She got a 50% tip. <laughs> Why? Because that waitress didn't control much, but she controlled the fruit ladle. <laughs> and that, that was her extra. She, what was that waitress doing in her own little universe? She was thinking entrepreneurially. I'm going to give this guy a little extra dollop of fruit. <laughs> Think entrepreneurially in whatever you do. Where can I fork this off? Find a new job. Find a new opportunity. Find a new business. Every boss today in a hyper-connected world, Ellen Coleman from DuPont in our book, she said something that really struck me. She said, I need every employee at DuPont to be present, to be paying attention. Where's there a new opportunity here? The mo world's moving too fast for Ellen Coleman at the pyramid, top of the pyramid in DuPont to know that, that you could do, fork this off Kevlar or whatever. Think entrepreneurially in whatever you do. 
So my advice is, I'll end here on this. Think like an immigrant, stay hungry. Think like an artisan, take pride. Think like a starter upper and always be in beta. And think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House and always be entrepreneurial because we really do, I can say as a Minnesotan, live in Garrison Keeler's Lake Wobicon, <laughs> where all the men are strong, all the women are beautiful, and all the children need to be above average. <laughs> Thanks. Look over here. Yeah. My name is Janice Kaminer Resnick. I'm an attorney, and I actually founded a, um, an anti genocide nonprofit right. many years ago. Your analysis works for the, three, the, for the three billion people right. in the world that are sort of part of the Western conversation. But I'm wondering what you see as the obligation or responsibility of that Western world for the other billions of people in the world who are being raped and who are yeah. being murdered and who are being victimized and whose education yeah. levels are, are non-existent and how those two worlds reconcile. Yeah, um, it's a very good question, thank you. And it's a very, it's a very hard question because I think that we need to do what we can where we can. Um, but it seems to me that comes in different packages. One is to shine a spotlight on uh, abuses, okay? Um, through diplomacy and through media and everything we can. I think of, uh, to pick a subject that's in the news today, um, Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe's Zimbabwe, you know, uh, a horror show. And um, I happen to have some friends from Zimbabwe, so I sort of kept up with that. And, uh, but one of the problems that we face is how do we shine a spotlight when Zimbabwe's own immediate neighbors don't shine a spotlight? When its immediate neighbors, like South Africa, are enablers of an awful, tyrannical regime. So you have that problem. Second, I went through the whole Iraq war thing. I saw what happened when we tried to fix a country through invading a country. That turned out to be a disaster. But is the opposite true? Doing nothing. So we face that challenge now in Syria. You know, um, terrible genocide happening there. But the problem is, it's the regime against the people. It's also some of the Islamist groups against the secular groups. And unfortunately, sometimes it's the secular groups against the Islamists. And so I think Pre President Obama, in facing the Syria challenge, I've heard him talk about this, has said, everyone has advice for how I get in. Tell me how I get out. And so that's really what I wrestle with uh, on every one of these issues. Tell me what can be done that will be uh, effective. Um, tell me what can be done that will be sustainable with the American people because of cost. But also tell me what the people there have to do. Um, it isn't just on us. I've, I'm not an expert on Africa at all. My colleague Nick Kristoff is, and you'd be much better directing this question to him than to me. But in the Middle East, you know, um, I've seen so many people saying, it's your fault, it's my fault, do something. To which I am tempted sometimes to say, now let me get this straight. Because Sunnis and Shiites are killing each other in Syria, fighting over who is the proper heir to the Prophet Muhammad in 622. I don't mean this is funny. I don't mean this is funny. I am supposed to tell my neighbors to send their 19-year-old son to sit between them and stop the fighting between them. And so I think, I, I tend to view this in a, in a much more maybe tough-minded, balanced way. I am glad there are people out there who are shining these spotlights, and I want my government to do what it can, where it can. But I never lose sight of the responsibility of the people there as well. So thanks for your question. Yeah. We have a few more minutes. Yeah. Uh, I'll take t two more questions. Yeah.
I'll take two more questions. Yeah. The boss says I can take as many as I want. <laughs> My name is uh, Jack Reel. I uh, live in No Name, Colorado. And um, my question, I, I worked for 15 years in Denver with homeless people. And so as I listen to you speak about the technology and the average and uh, entrepreneurial things, I, if I could say it this way, yesterday I heard talk about uh, philanthropy. And that is the domain of people who are in capitalism who have lots of money. And it seems to me that the ladder for improvement in capitalism, the bottom three lungs, rungs are missing. Similarly, I worry about what you're saying about the world. Three billion people, yes, may be connected. What about the rest? That's my question. Yeah, very good question. It's an important question. I say a couple things. Do not confuse, and this is a problem I face a lot, my analytical enthusiasm for describing the logic of what I see and the moving parts because the reporter in me enjoys that sense of discovery with approval or disapproval. Okay? I can just assure you one thing. I didn't do this. Okay? And um, I, I don't mean that in a cute way. I think what I can contribute is if we don't understand the system and what's going on, then we can't, and the thing about globalization, you have to understand, it's everything and it's opposite. It is incredibly empowering and incredibly disempowering. You feel like huge global multinationals, you know, and yet I can start a multinational overnight. It's incredibly democratizing. Ask Erdogan. And incredibly authoritarian. Ask the citizens of Russia or China whose governments use the same thing. It's incredibly homogenizing. It's a pizza hut, you know, on every corner, at the Spanish steps to outside the pyramids. And it's incredibly particularizing. I can sit here in Aspen and listen to music from my home country from 193 different countries from here. So it's everything in its opposite. And our job is to get the most out of the best and cushion the worst. The danger is when people say, what about them, okay, is that it makes it sound like um, there's nothing we can do for them. And I really, really disagree with that. But I think it needs people like you to say, wow, this thing is so entrepreneurial. It's lowering the cost for so many new technologies, services, and initiatives. How can we take the best and apply it to fixing the worst? And I think a lot of people are doing that. I think a lot of them are in this room. Um, but it's, it's never going to happen uh, overnight. I think what the government's job is, is to not only, is to A, provide that safety net, you know, um, which we'll never have if we don't grow incomes. So we got to have that in order to redistribute. You have to have something to redistribute. Um, and so let's, let's do that. But also to incentivize, through legal and other ways, people applying their, image, their creativity and technology to solving those problems. I think what's really exciting about what's going on in the world today, so I, I got into this whole thing because back in 2004, I did a documentary on outsourcing in India. And the reason I, did, I was doing documentaries for the Discovery Channel, that's, I, I got into the whole world as flat thing because I was doing documentaries for, the, um, uh, for Discovery. We had done one on 9-11, we did one on the wall in Israel, and in 2004, Discovery came and said, and this will be an answer to your question, um, uh, um, what should you want to do your next documentary on? And my idea was we should do a documentary about why everybody hates America. In 2004, sort of the Bush era. Um, and so uh, they said, well, what would you like to do? I said, you know, I got this crazy idea. I think we should go to call centers all over the world and interview young people who spend their days imitating Americans, foreigners, <laughs> on what they think of America. Um, sort of Zhao by night, you know, John by day, or John by night and Zhao by day, you know. And I thought it'd make a very interesting double mirror to talk to all these young people in call centers who imitate Americans at night and then protest against America during the day. That's how it all started. 
and then we morphed it into something else. Well, what was, that, what was actually going on that enabled that was that the world got flat enough so we could actually draw on, in, the reason outsourcing became a story was because of Y2K. So we had this Y2K problem. Every computer needed to re be remediated, the calendar, otherwise it was gonna shut down water and electricity. And the only place in the world where there are enough engineers to remediate that many computers was in India. And so the world had just gotten flat enough that we could draw on tens of thousands of Indian engineers to help us solve our problems. Now here's what I find really cool, because I go to India every year, and every year I do the same thing. I get NASCOM, the Indian High Tech Association, to get me together with their 10 or 12 hottest young male, female, innovator entrepreneurs. And here's what I've noticed in the last two years. They're now using all the skills they learned solving our problems to solve their problems. And they're doing it on cost platforms, because they have to be able to be sold in, in India, that um, are remarkable. Whether it's healthcare, um, dealing with pregnancy and, and um, uh, reproductive rights, um, whether it's legal issues. If you are looking for the most exciting innovations to help homeless people in Denver, spend two weeks in New Delhi. You will find more innovation that can be applied here for less money than anywhere else in the world. And what excites me about the world today, the reason I'm an optimist, is because we now have three billion people with the ability to solve the world's biggest problems, not just the tiny number we had 50 years ago. So, last question. We wanna get a, a, a woman who, we, we, we wanna spread, yeah, you right here. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you. Marilyn, no. Hold on. One second. Hi. Marilyn Rosenfield Fields, and I'm from Minneapolis. We went to nursery school together, so it's a setup. <laughs> High school together. And my favorite restaurant also growing up was Perkins Pancake House. My father would take my sister and I there every Thanksgiving while my mom was cooking dinner, and I got chocolate chip pancakes, and the waitress never gave me extra. <laughs> okay. So, a problem. But going back to the first question, yeah. talking about Yeah, hold it closer. Oh. Going back to the first question, talking about education and those children who are not able to afford higher education. How about the children, those same children who are, come from poverty level families, they go to kindergarten without having any kind of preschool and the reading, writing and arithmetic isn't there and will never be there. Why do I, I really don't hear people talk about early childhood education. Well, you know, in fairness, to thank you, yeah, in fairness to President Obama, um, that was part of his State of the Union. Um, in, fa in fairness to President Obama, it was part of the State of the Union. Um, and, you know, if we had, um, if our politics weren't so crazy messed up, um, it would be part of any initiative we would be doing now on education. It would be part of any trade-off. I'll give you early childhood education and, and, and you give me, you know, something on taxes or whatever the Republicans want. Um, because there, there is no study that doesn't show that investing in early childhood education you know, pays off multiple times down the road. But um, you know, unfortunately, our politics is, uh, is so broken that um, we, can't, we actually can't get to the right answers that we know are the right answers. So everything has to be second best. And until uh, people use their voting power uh, to elect people who are not just ready to make suboptimal choices for every big issue we face, um, you know, we will, I think, be, uh, be stuck in this, um, uh, in this situation. But what gives me uh, hope, I don't want to end on such a negative note, um, is that uh, I do get to travel around the country a lot. And more and more I see the thing that saves us as a country, it's not gonna save early childhood education at scale. That's a scale problem, as you know. But this country, blessedly so, is still full of people who just didn't get the word. They didn't get the word that China's gonna eat our breakfast. They didn't get the word that Germany's gonna eat our lunch. And they just start stuff and fix stuff and invent stuff and collaborate on stuff. And as I said in a column the other day, if you want to be an optimist about America, stand on your head because the country looks so much better 
from the bottom up than from the top down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tom, thank you very, 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 very much. This is great. Listen, before we break, for the last 72 hours, the campus has been full of 350 what Tom Friedman would call high-energy entrepreneurs from 32 countries for the inaugural Aspen Leaders Action Forum. Our goal was to connect, refresh, inspire, and hopefully spur these 350 to take on new action pledges in terms of what they would do in the world. How do we do? We got a quick two-minute film. We captured some of those pledges over the last few days. It'll be fast, but have a quick look. The Aspen Institute has always been a leadership institute. It drills down into public policy, whether it's on education or defense policy. And so if we're just talking about it without giving people the opportunity to make the world a better place, we're not doing our job. My action pledge is to build a world-class sustainable manufacturing facility in the U.S. Midwest. So I am looking to create a platform to broadcast the work of high school students who may be otherwise overlooked by academic measures because of their talents that lie in the arts. So my pledge is to use uh, the mobile tool technology to leapfrog education to employment for uh, youth in Africa. My action pledge is related to the predictive policing uh, company that I'm working with, and that's to reduce gun violence in the, United, in the United States using technology. My action pledge is to get my project to provide life-changing internship opportunities for Ghanaian students live before the end of the year. My action pledge is to create the future of the university, the future of higher education, to help develop the next generation of innovators, leaders, and entrepreneurs. My action pledge is to uh, decrease the number of uninvestigated rape cases in South Africa. My action pledge is to deepen the impact that we have uh, through the social entrepreneurs that we incubate. My pledge is to take five social enterprises to scale and sustainability by 2017. So my action pledge is to lower the uninsured rate for African Americans in South Carolina below 15% by the end of next year. That's just a few of the action pledges we've captured. Hopefully the rain hasn't erased the others, but if you have a look across campus, we've built two action walls. And what we asked our fellows to do from around the world was to not just think about their action pledges, but to come out and declare them openly. We've captured over 200 pledges so far. We're delighted. What is spurring us on? Well, we opened this event 72 hours ago with a re revisitation of Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham City Jail. You'll remember, those of you who were there, that Ben Dunlap came up to the stage and he reminded us of something very important. What was that? In the struggle for justice, there are no bystanders. Let's not be bystanders, let's act. Thank you very much, see you at the same time next year. <laughs>